clear up your messages. That's fine. Okay, we are live now. Yeah. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ruchira Gupta, uh, who is founder of Indian anti-sex traffic organization called Apnaap. She has helped more than twenty thousand girls and women to exit the prostitution. She is a recipient of many prestigious awards, including Emmy Award for her documentary, uh, Clinton Global Citizen Award, as well as the Distinction of Woman Award by United Nations. She is also visiting professor at NYU. So I would like to request Ruchira to share her experiences at grassroots level. So here is Ruchira Gupta. Hello, everyone. Nice to have you. Uh... somewhere out there in the virtual universe and i have some really interesting people in the room with me so uh, we are going to make more like a conversation and i will just explain my own life's journey and then everyone can ask questions as they feel like um, so i used to be a journalist and i'm a calcutta girl born and raised in calcutta uh, first job in calcutta i began with telegraph and at some point in my journalism life i was walking through the hills of nepal when i came across rows of villages which didn't have any girls from age 15 to 45 and uh, i began to ask the men who were drinking tea playing cards carrom uh, sitting in the sun uh, where the girls were and uh, many of the men and uh, people there didn't answer some were hostile some were some giggled some were sheepish but the few who did uh, they said that don't you know they all are in bombay and that was very surprising to me because these villages were almost two and a half hours away from the high base and uh, you know and bombay was 1400 kilometers away so i didn't understand how so many women and children could be in bombay which was so far away so as a good journalist i immediately began to investigate uh, and uh, you know the answer changed my life because i went into the villages of nepal and what i found was um you know little girls between the ages of 9 and 13 who were being sold off to traffickers who came from the big cities and the traffickers could be the local village procurer he could be a neighbor a brother a shopkeeper who would go to a poor and starving farmer and offer as little as 50 dollars or 100 dollars to the farmer and say i'll take your daughter to the big city offer her a job and uh, would you let her go anyway she's starving here she'll have food a bed and some money and she might even send some money back home and the farmers were so isolated and so uh, cut off from everything they had no idea what they were letting their daughters go to so they would let their daughters go and these men would collect together and women sometimes would collect together groups of 3 4 5 girls from different villages cluster them together take them to kathmandu biratnagar hitoda cluster them and then take them across the border and there were the karab border guards wink wink nod nod across the border on the other side were the lodges now what are the lodges the lodges are very shabby rooms uh, with um, made of plastic sheets and cement sheets and uh, the girls would be locked up in these lodges for two or three days starved beaten uh, drugged uh, you know also told repeatedly there's no going back this is your life now till they were ready to do anything and then they were handed over to transporters who would put them in trucks in trains and take them to the brothels of calcutta bombay delhi patna everywhere and there uh, what would happen is that um, when they uh, went there then there would be a pimp in these red light districts uh, who were managing the brothels and the pimp would negotiate the price of these girls based on their beauty now but what do i mean by beauty all of us from india know fair skin was at a premium uh, but the other thing which i found which was horrifying was the younger the better and the youngest i met was a 7 year old and she hadn't even begun menstruating and ice was used uh, to break up and besides that docile voluptuous you know because this is what the customers wanted and then these girls would be handed over to the brothel managers who would take them into these rows of rooms uh, with iron bars on the window four or five beds stuck inside the rooms uh, and you know just sarees dividing one bed from the other and there the girls were made available for eight or 10 customers every night 
and you know the first time they would fetch a higher prize because they were virgins uh, younger girls would of course fetch a higher prize because customers liked very sweet infantile girls because they're obviously buying domination and for 100 rupees 200 rupees was the prize so in american terms it would be like 30 cents per rape and then uh, behind the um, pimps and the brothel managers were the landlords behind the landlords were the um, you know customers of course the money lenders uh, and then uh, behind the customers running the entire trade were organized criminal gangs so these were not uh, petty criminals they might be in the it was a system which was operating the whole thing and what i also found was that in the past i used to think you know there's the prostitute with a heart of gold and she's a poor woman who's earning some money and a customer comes who's a poor migrant worker and he's looking for some affection and he pays money and he gets some sex in exchange so i was equating uh, sexual violence with affection in my own head growing up i was thinking uh, the poor woman is making some money uh, you know because she has so many her life is marked by absence of choices but suddenly i realized that that was complete romanticization at my part when i saw what was going on i saw that prostitution was a system which was exploiting the most vulnerable and that poor girl was normally not just poor she was female she was normally of from very marginalized castes so all all of them not normally all every single one i met and she was a teenager so she had like four intersecting inequalities already and uh, there was no one there to protect her and uh, because she was taken away from home so early and she already came from dis- in a disadvantaged situation so early she was also very often had no skills to get out so she didn't have uh, education she didn't have proper health uh, she didn't have uh, she began to suffer from psychosocial trauma inside the brothels uh, from the repeated rape she began to suffer from insomnia repeated abortions um, ptsd is very common in the brothel system so then i realized that uh, you know this system of prostitution actually does not help her at all what it does is this entire system lives off her so she's not the one who's making money because for the first 5 years this girl was kept like a bonded slave and no money was given to her because the brothel keeper would say oh your father took some money now she didn't know enough to know to count because probably that loan was repaid in a week's time but she didn't know and then she had children in the first two years which the brothel manager makes children these children have children and then they hold the child hostage to control the girl so they do that and then uh, also what happened was that i note uh, you know is that she doesn't get any of the money as i mentioned in the first 5 years but then in the second 5 years uh, she's told you can keep uh, a system called adhya like almost like a share cropper so she's told you can keep half of what you earn but out of the half that she earns she first of all she doesn't know how to count because she's suffering from ptsd and other things and also she's isolated and beaten up so badly uh the other thing which also begins to happen is that she has to they tell her that from your money you have to pay for the food you eat the makeup you put on the water you drink or you bathe with uh, the bed that your child sleeps on uh, the muscle man who protects you from the police and drugs and alcohol because the women and children become dependent on drugs and alcohol very quickly as a coping mechanism to cope with this kind of repeated violence and so she doesn't make any money she only gets deeper into debt and in prostitution you earn the most in any case on the first night because it's not that you gain, earn more with more experience as your body begins to look more used and more um, disease ridden uh, customers want fresh looking girls this use the word naya mal in um, the red light district so uh, you know this whole romanticization i quickly understood was just the romanticization of exploitation by in making it invisible by giving it a different word and uh, so these uh, women didn't make money so who did why was this trade running brothel manager was definitely making money the pimps were making money the traffickers were making money the muscle men were making money the corrupt police officers were making money in fact many of the brothels were owned anonymously by uh, police officers and uh, some of them would come and take free services and all of that so 
this was a whole nexus and everyone was living off this girl and in fact very often even the customers uh, you know were almost uh, manipulated into becoming uh, addicts who wanted sex with violence in this entire system so it wasn't serving them in any way also so it wasn't a win win for the two people i thought was a win win it was for everybody else and uh, so i uh, decided that i have to tell this story because as a journalist i'd covered war i'd been a journalist for 14 years by then i'd covered famine i'd covered caste conflict i'd covered ethnic conflict in the northeast uh, but i had never seen this kind of deliberate exploitation of one human being by another and so i thought i have to tell this story many people said oh it's a old news you know it's not a story i said for every girl who's raped it's new and so i insisted on telling the story i won an emmy for outstanding investigative journalism for it and uh, i was here in new york at the broadway marquis hotel this was 1995 96 and you know the glamour and all of that i was on stage and i had the emmy and it all seemed irrelevant literally and i thought you know this is not what i want to do and i was getting really good job offers then so i quit journalism not knowing what i was doing but went back to the women in bombay who had told me their stories and helped me uh, to make my documentary and uh, i showed them the film i shared the emmy with them and i said i've told your story here's the award and they said so what <laughs> and i said uh, they said you've got to help us and i said i am a storyteller i'm a journalist so i don't know how to do anything else i'm not a doctor i'm not a social worker i'm not even a teacher and uh, you know i only know how to expose the problem so they said but you know english i said yes i do and they said you have access to money and networks and i said yes i do so they said that uh, then you know you have to help us and i said what do you want and they said we want to save our daughters from the same fate that we have had so um based on that uh, i said that okay let's try and create an organization and uh, we decided to call the organization apne aap apne aap as all of you know means uh, self action in hindi and uh, you know the reason we called it apne aap was that we thought that nobody is going to help us we have to do it ourselves but through our collective strength so we called it initially we called it apne aap means collective and uh, then uh, that's how we started and we hired a teacher and rented a room and we said okay we'll get the kids ready for school and we put a straw mat on the floor nothing fancy right in the heart of the red light district and began to teach the kids and when the kids were ready for school uh, you know everyone said the principal is refusing to admit the kids their children are prostitutes so we said let's form a circle a mahila mandal and go together so that was how the first apne aap mahila mandal went to the school begged cried pleaded and said our children our children to the principal relented and the children were admitted they did extremely well and you know ones in bard college one went off and became an animation artist and you know they have good jobs dominos meat pizza parlor this that and so that happened and fast forward now we have educated uh, more than uh, i think more than 2000 or 3000 children of prostituted women through school who are in college many of them have finished college and got jobs and taken their mothers out of the red light area so that's been a huge success uh, for apne aap uh, uh, at the same time when the mothers saw that the children were um, changing they began to feel hope again you know something which had been dead inside them came to life again and they said what about us and i said so what about you and uh, they said that we want to get out too and i said okay so we know how to organize and uh, you know we didn't have a business plan we didn't know how to form a business plan at that time so i when i started apne aap i asked the women i said what are your dreams and they had four dreams the first dream was school for their children the second was a job in an office for themselves the third was a room of their own which was really uh, surprising to me i was an english literature student so to hear virginia wolf in the brothels of bombay was very good uh, and the fourth was justice 
and i remember asking them you know in that the brothels are like full of rats little windows smell of sperm and sweat uh, 20 rooms to one toilet um, dirty shabby clothes and, you know i was thinking i said very noisy music playing all the time alcohol being sold vendors coming and going so i remember asking them i said what does a job in an office mean to you and they said somewhere where we will not uh, we will get a fixed monthly income old age pension um nobody will beat us and shout at us where we will be treated with dignity and i thought of course you know you want a job in an office and a room of their own they said something which is just our own where we can sleep for as long as we want to nobody can walk in whenever they want to and our children can play safely on the floor because in a brothel a customer reaches out to the child while visiting the mother and very often you know the woman is providing sex on the bed and the child is playing on the floor it's very normal and justice to them meant they said that we wanted someone to protect us when we were pulled out of school and put into a brothel but there was nobody to protect us nobody watched out for us no education officer or anything and when they were put into a brothel whenever they tried to run away the police would send them back saying that this is your home this is your life now there's no going back so they said we would have liked to be protected that was one part of justice and the other thing they said was that anybody who bought us or sold us they needed to be uh, punished severely they brokered away our dreams so accountability so th- that became our sort of our business plan and of course we made it better and better as we went along and now we've helped more than 40000 women girls their family members since then you know and apne aap had to re-register at one point in terms of challenges because one of my trustees of apne aap women's collective who was my own uncle turned out to be a pedophile and uh, it you know my sister had a triggered memory and she told me about it and he refused to leave maybe because i, I couldn't get him out so i re-registered apne aap women's collective as apne aap women worldwide to make sure that you know i could carry on the work but not have him included in it so you know it's been a journey and the journey has been tough i've had to face up pimps and brothel keepers i've had a knife pulled out at me i've had um and the women protected me you know uh, once when i was inside the brothel someone pulled out a knife at me at me and said that i won't let you be here and 22 women in prostitution formed a circle around me and they said that we want her to work with us we have told her our story because we want a future for our daughters and if you kill her <coughs> you've got to kill us first and uh, the man thought it was too much trouble to kill 23 women and went away that's when we realized the power of strength of collectivization and uh, i remember when i started apne aap people would say that um, why call it apne aap you know nobody will understand it it sounds like apnea so i said people will learn and of course you know you were talking about the awards that i've got and you know i've got many awards and many recognition from the legion de honor by the french government to the clinton award and all of that and people have learned i've heard president clinton use the word apne aap as i have heard the french president use the word apne aap so different people have been able to pronounce it and what we have done is that we have listened to the women and translated it into it's been a learning because luckily i think i'm glad i was not a social worker or didn't know how to run an ngo because we sat together talked to each other and we listened to each other so our policy is literally evolved from the ground up not top down but bottom up and that's why they were practical and what we did was started with education went on to safe space of course and then went on to not livelihoods which are again imposed from the top like microfinance you know which really should a prostitute be prostituting herself to repay a debt no that wouldn't have defeated the purposes it was very easy to understand what we had to do because we were in touch with the ground and so no theoretical jargon could be imposed on us very easily and uh, because of that even we, when we as we grew and we reached out to more and more circles of women across india so we started in bombay went to calcutta went to bihar we work in caste communities now uh, who are suffering from intergenerational prostitution and uh, these caste communities were labeled as criminal tribes under british colonialism the nats the bedias the sasis and the kanjars 
who were marginalized and their professions were commodified to the extent that they ended up uh, you know just performing their their things without having any relevance to anything so the nuts who made utensils and bridges from bamboos were suddenly performing on bamboo and you know becoming entertainment artists and then into prostitution so we started working in such communities across india and through the articulation of our policies collectively we were able to influence uh, law we played a big role in changing the law in india on uh, trafficking india didn't have a law on trafficking so 2013 when the bus rape happened when everybody was asking for stricter accountability for sexual violence we said prostitution is commercial rape and uh, we need this diff trafficking to be defined and we managed to play a role in the justice varma commission to get section 370 of the indian penal code passed same thing with the un protocol i came in uh, showed my movie the selling of innocence spoke and played a role in the creation of both the un protocol and um, the global plan of action to end trafficking as an indian citizen i went and testified to the us senate the us government did not have a law on trafficking showed my movie and asked for a passage of the trafficking victim protection act the first law in us on trafficking and uh, you know it's been a lifelong fight and a struggle for justice and sometimes we've succeeded in terms of changing legal frameworks across the world a uh, 140 countries have now signed on to the un protocol on trafficking and as a result each country is changing its law has changed its law most of them to uh, make it better applicable to combat trafficking uh, so we have had great successes and we've also had some challenges <coughs> which are new challenges one is that you know the normalcy or the pervasiveness of the market has so entered people's psychology that anything can be for sale right and anything can be justified if someone pays for it so uh, very often people come and say oh but he paid for it so there's a ethics attached with that but if you're paying for a human body that is a modern form of slavery you're paying for that person's body you are invading someone's body prostitution is based on penetration you can't legislate that away and that means that you are paying for someone's body and uh, so it's not justified the violence is definitely not justified and so that is a big challenge for us uh, you know the nor- the way the market has entered our psychology how to explain to people that everything should not be for sale and if we say that then people say it's a moral argument but also what has happened because of this normalization is two big things uh, labor movements have also uh, the gains made by labor struggles have actually been eroded so what we would define as exploitation uh, 25 years ago we do not define as exploitation anymore so 20 years ago uh, you know uh, we would define exploitation as anything which was harmful to the human body or to the human mind or to the human psyche and labor struggles would struggle against that you know they would take a stand against that and today exploitation is not defined by harm it is defined by choice which is such a strange thing that oh if they choose it then it is not exploitation but nobody understands the context of choice anymore you know the context can be i can be poor female low caste and a teenager half four of my choice choices are taken away and that may make sure that i'm not educated i'm um, don't have a roof over my head i may not have access to uh, proper health care it could be just re- reduce my choices so what is a choice you know and choice will it may still lead to harm so how, why is it that we fallen into this uh, capitalist trap i would say of thinking that choices make everything okay choices are actually in the context that they operate in and uh, the choices i make or any of you make uh, are going to be very different uh, than the choices that a girl in a village in nepal or a little girl in sonagachi in calcutta is making sitting on a bed in a brothel you know so we have to really understand that how 
a sort of uh, thing is being thrust down upon us. And what is at stake here really is that we will one day just end up, prostitution itself will become a case study. And the first threshold of how we allow ourselves to be uh, manipulated into accepting exploitation as work. Because that's the biggest challenge that we are facing right now. Do you find under the law in India, the trafficking law, do, are there prosecutions under that? I'm just curious with the implementation and enforcement. In different, uh, so there have been some, but uh, you know, because of lack of trading of the new law, Section 370 IPC. So most police officers don't even know what the law is. And as I told you, the police are part of the problem. So many of them are making money off the sex industry. So they don't want to implement the law. The third is that there are many NGOs who don't know the law. And so they have sort of like this kind of um, very patronizing attitude uh, where it's about the NGO leader who is saving the girl. So, you know, they love doing this raid and rescue kind of thing where they'll go knock down a door, pull a girl out and put her into a shelter. Never mind what happens to her in the shelter or beyond. So it's not even a holistic strategy uh, to look at inequality. And most of these NGOs who are doing that uh, are, you know, pardon my saying so, but men, all these men love rescuing girls from brothels. So, uh, you know, they'll just jump in and all. And it's all the women running the shelters and the, all the men raiding brothels. You know, it's like the most stereotype thing. And uh, we really need to see the model again. So I think there's a problem. And the other NGOs who work in the red light districts, besides those ones doing raid and rescue and running shelters, are um, the ones doing public health programs. So they turn a blind eye to the exploitation, go inside a brothel, distribute their condoms and get out. They, they are just a condom distribution program. But what ends up happening as a result is that they end up uh, collaborating with brothel keepers and brothel managers uh, for ease of access inside the brothel. So they end up empowering the whole system. And they also create a sort of a, a false notion of quote unquote ethical demand where they make a customer feel it's all right to buy sex if he puts on a condom. Because that's all they think about. They don't think about the girl. And I have met many customers who have told me, oh, you know, I helped her eat. So, you know, as if he was obliging the girl. I helped her eat oh. by buying her because I gave her some money and so she must have got some food at the end of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, that uh, the whole thing of choice reminds me of Kanye West, you know, saying slavery is a choice. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same kind of psychology. Yeah. And uh, it comes from the, I mean, basically, of course, like they're not talking about history. They are just, you know, going to rewrite what's going to happen. Like we have to accept this uh, as a fact. And if you are poor, it's poor by choice. And if you are, you know, uh, poor in that profession, it's by choice. It's not a historical. Uh, but I have a question regarding the, um, you know, this provisionness of the internet and the social media and porn and, uh, you know, like uh, blackmail and that kind of stuff. So uh, is that playing an increasing role in sort of the... Huge, huge, because, uh, you know, pornography has become so violent. And I want to differentiate between pornography and erotica. Because I'm not against sex, you know, I'm against sexual exploitation. And I think most of us in the room are not against sex, but we are against sexual exploitation. And pornography has become rape with a camera pointed at it. So if you look at the porn narratives and, you know, it's really hard to watch them. So I don't even say, look at it, just listen to me and I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> so the porn narrative really is, you know, a girl being penetrated into every part of her body from her mouth, her anus, her vagina, everywhere. And she's crying in pain. You can see she's in pain and she's crying. And yet she's saying, give me more. So it's such a confusing message. And that's what, you know, the first encounter for many young men with sex is through porn, unfortunately, thanks to the growth of the internet. So what happens is a 12-year-old is surfing the net to do homework and a cartoon co character pops up, you know, saying, want to have some fun with me. Two or three clicks later, he's watching her being raped. And she's crying, she's in pain, but she's saying, give me more. So he mixes up sex with violence. And he mixes up pain uh, with pleasure. And he mixes up, he thinks no means yes, uh, because he doesn't know, you know, she's giving confused messages. 
and then he begins to want that kind of sex it actually cuts off empathy and it's very interesting so there's been this rise india has become the third largest user of porn in the world and uh, you know somebody did a search through satellite or something to find out where were the largest users and funnily enough they were in the northeast and kashmir and i was thinking why and then i re- realized army bases wherever there are big concentrations of men they're sitting and watching porn and uh, you know also the connection of porn with violence because if you have to go out and kill you have to think up you know you have to build it up in your mind psychologically before you go out and do any kind of violence so you know porn is helps a lot and even the people the six men who raped um uh, jyoti singh pande uh, on the bus they all watched porn together they bought a sim card for 20 rupees you can buy porn clips on sim cards for 20 rupees in india so they bought a sim card at a railway station and uh, you know they just watched it together and before going out and looking for a girl and you know if you look at the interviews in Leslie Adwin's film the guy says that we were we had watched porn we were going to go to gp road which is delhi's red light district to buy a girl but then there was one available on the bus so look at the links in the heads uh, from porn to buying sex finding a girl out at night who in their minds a girl out at night alone with a guy must be a prostitute or is definitely a fair game so this kind of thing where does it come from this kind of psychological feeling that these girls are available from the narratives they are watching on social media and it is being sold and you know what's happening at the same time is that this this particular thing of rise of porn interestingly enough is also so connected with the rise of fascism it is very interesting because fascism eroticizes violence and uh, you know bloodletting and violence is something that the fascist mind makes you aspire to because it has to give you a kick and how do you get it through that violence right so one is the individual acts of violence kicking someone trampling someone etc etc the other is eventually war so there's such a link yeah i think with violence you know from my experience like uh, it seems very normal at the time and the reason i'm saying is at this experience like you know i was in uh, oissa last time and this uh, is very maoist to be for education i mean i yeah. I was in Malkangiri, very remote area, where you know we were doing a bond labor project, and then uh, I photographed some you know ganja plantations at at, at night, area, and then literally a people squat, you know, guns, and uh, I mean, you know, I mean, I thought like you know this was it, you know, uh, but and I heard like these people do bad stuff. I mean, they will kill informers, and then you know the next day, like there was a police military operation too. I mean, they said that you know informer and that, but anyway, thankfully I. managed to have a conversation and get out but the uh, uh, reason is you know traveling in that area and I've talked to some you know chapis kada rip in the sabaj dum and like the people who were who they, you know they said that no always came and killed some and then the army came and then burnt our homes and raped killed but they seemed surprisingly resilient and they keep you know like they were talking about it openly and I was like too ashamed to even like you know I'm part of this world like that is sort of creating this problem but uh violence uh, is uh, anybody can do it because it seems very normal at that time that's what exactly. i think exactly you know, right like if you're a, you know which i have to like you know first time it is a awful thing but if you are like a perpetrator or something if we, our mind can just go like that it's like it seems very normal at the time and and, and uh, so therefore obviously therefore it has to be legislation you know like uh, with the internet is she makes it very accessible and you know it's very normal like uh, i read like about this you know this pedophile like how people you know pick him like he did that you know since they literally they have done these brain scans and they can't find a difference and it was like that you know apply course and it seems like it, it was so easy yeah and it doesn't feel that you're doing it with a human being so it feels fine but yeah. what you don't realize is that your brain is getting rewired when you're doing it with a non-human being so preparing you for the time when you can do it to a human being yes because by the, because if you do it repeat times uh, with a non-human being but then you get used to the idea and then when you do it to a human being the person just gets substituted for the person you saw on screen 
yeah, I mean, I mean that, that's uh, I read like there were you know there's this whole gang that got busted of pedophiles in in England and Australia and everywhere, and they were just reassigning <coughs> people like in Thailand and Philippines, you know, like little kids like who were forced to perform sex acts. So so now like in Nepal, the story is that that child need not even go to Bombay anymore. I'm just in theory, you know, because it's forced into this room and they were you know, perform some acts even with a toy or something, and that's that's a revenue generating mechanism. So huge, you know. So many of these uh, places now, you know, because tech technology is so easily accessible and it's so cheap. So every basement in Kathmandu or Biratnagar or Siliguri, all these places are uh, making movies, you know, and they are not they're making blue movies really. And uh, for example, UP has become the biggest, largest uh, consumer of rape videos. They're called rape videos. And some of the rape videos are real rape videos because people say we want real rape videos. We don't want mock ones. Because, you know, they want to go to the, the threshold changes. Yes, so in what kind of legislation is, since this is also international and uh, something that is like, uh, obviously, like now the consumer is no longer in Bombay, you know, it is anywhere. So, what kind of, uh, and that's where UN or, or bodies come in, what kind of uh, ways legislation is there? This has to be a UN criminal case because who, how do you catch people across borders? And, and you know, Facebook or like what does uh, social media like, how do they have a rules against this? Kind of thing? Yeah, so basically uh, what's happened is that, of course, we have to keep up with technology and we have to keep up with organized crime. Now, both are like hard, you know, because both are better organized and better funded than we activists are. But we do our best. So one of the things we first tried to do for the organized crime part was to get uh, international law passed to recognize the dynamics of what's happening now. It's not it's not like 19th century slavery where people are being kidnapped from the villages in Africa and being put in chains on ships and being brought uh, to America to work in plantations. No. So uh, then what is it which is happening, right? People may not even be transported, as uh, you know, Sid was saying. People may be uh, actually uh, just filmed where they are and raped where they are. But now with virtua virtuality through the internet, they can be taken anywhere and sold anywhere as a DVD <coughs> or YouTube or iTunes or I don't know what. So uh, the thing is that uh, we had to first create the frameworks to make this a crime. So we did that internationally, and it's called the Trans, uh, the Convention on Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, and we put what, how does trafficking happen? What are the means used, and what is the purpose? All of it that we could capture in that moment, we have put into that protocol. So it's called the UN Protocol to End Trafficking in Persons, comma especially women and children. We want to emphasize it that the most trafficked people are women and children. And uh, this is part, this is supplementary to the UN protocol on transnational crime. So we recognized it as a transnational crime, defined it. We created a whole new definition based on today's circumstances in which we put, uh, we made choice of a victim irrelevant because I can choose under any circumstances. I may be a refugee. My child may be being held homeless. I may be poor, Dalit, anything. So we said that, you know, the, her, if she's chosen it, it doesn't mean anything. Consent is irrelevant because she may consent under, I may be married to someone and my husband may want to become the pimp. So uh, we made consent irrelevant in the protocol. We made movement irrelevant to the protocol. It may happen, may not happen. Uh, movement is not a necessary part of trafficking anymore based on the question that you are asking. What if a child is raped in Kathmandu and taped in Kathmandu and the DVDs are sold all over the world, right? Uh, we also made sure that the women who are uh, trafficked so they could be trafficked for prostitution, for the organ trade, kidneys and cornea. They could be trafficked to become child soldiers. Uh, they could be trafficked for um, domestic servitude, cheap labor, you know, all kinds of things women and men are trafficked for and children. So we put in a whole mail order brides, all of that. Uh, so we put all those things. And if they are trafficked for any of those things, then uh, what are the means used? We made a list of the means force, fraud, coercion, but we also put in something very important, abuse of a position of vulnerability, so that we can look at what makes people vulnerable and how it is abused. Um, and we made sure to decriminalize the victims of human trafficking so that they should not be punished under any circumstances. 
and shifted the blame to the perpetrator. To, and so we said we have to address the demand for trafficking. And so that is how uh, we uh, set up the whole legal framework. And that framework has now become the framework in all the countries of the world. So from Norway to Sweden, to France, to Ireland, India, UK, USA, everywhere. What about like these heavy faced residents from countries which didn't want to adopt? Like yeah, so Asia Germany and and Holland did not want to adopt. New Zealand did not want to adopt. Okay. Uh, these were uh, some parts of Australia. So most countries were willing to adopt, but Iran, uh, Germany, New Zealand, uh, Australia, and Holland did not want to adopt. But Sweden, Norway, France. Uh, Ireland, both the islands, UK, USA, India have now slowly, I feel we face resistance in all these countries also, but they've begun to adopt. And the latest is that Germany also wants to revise its law and Holland also wants to revise its law. So then it will be New Zealand and maybe I don't know which other country. Yeah, I mean, you said. Oh, no, I, just, I was just wondering that the way you were describing, let's say, the girls in Nepal are going to Mumbai. Do you see coming out of India, like, I mean, you hear about domestic servitude somewhere in the US, but do you see people going um, west to, you know, like from India being sort of... Yeah, and now it's not so much girls from Nepal to India. This was like 25 years okay. ago. Now it is go Indian girls being sold inside India. It does, okay, and, it does, uh, it does, you know, in India, they are like from Hyderabad to Bombay okay. or from Sundarbans to Calcutta or Murshidabad to Calcutta. So it's, you know, it could be very much internal. Sometimes a girl could be sold on the very same bed that she's born in. Um, in the US, uh, you know, it could be in the same zip code. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. So, so, like so basically, to explain trafficking, I would say pimping is trafficking. So if someone is uh, a third party facilitator making money off selling somebody for sex, then that is trafficking as per the UN protocol and the US law. So that is great. In terms of uh, social media, you know, Facebook has been used, but also other things like Craigslist and Backpage, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, were used by the sex industry to sell girls. So we had to go to the Hill and lobby for passage of laws. And there, there are two new laws called FOSTA and SESTA to actually put curbs on uh, regulations on... Uh, this kind of thing, the misuse of uh, these uh, sites to sell things, to sell women, to sell human beings. So we had to do that. But it's you know, it's so hard. The, in the dark web, so many sites pop up. Uh, so it has been hard. And, and, then, and uh, to, uh, yeah, there have been Indian people trafficked to the United States and I help them all the time, you know. So sometimes I'll uh, get them counseling, legal services, uh, new jobs, new identities if they decide to try testify against a trafficker. The State Department, FBI, NGOs all collaborate to do that. So there have been instances of trafficking to the US, both for prostitution and for cheap labor, uh, to Dubai, to... Uh, yeah, I've met girls in UK, I've met girls in Dubai, Ireland, Germany, all over the world, yeah. But it's also vice versa, like American girls are sold here. So there's something called the Minnesota Pipeline, which is girls from Minnesota being trafficked to New York, which has a big sex tourism industry. And uh, the reason they are trafficked is because they, have bl they are blonde and blue-eyed. And sex tourists want what they think is the typical American girl. But mostly prostitution, trafficking for prostitution is very racialized. So most of those who are in prostitution in America are uh, the 15-year-old Native American or black girl. And in, in Europe, very often they are refugees or illegal immigrants uh, on top of that. Yeah, I mean, um, and also like uh, I'm continuing on that email, uh, internet thing. Like, there's this idea of deep fake. You know, now we can make a video which is not real. You know, first of all, you know, uh, 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 Amitabh's daughter, like they made this like the day after he wrote this uh, article on uh, uh, Modi. You know, hmm. they made a sex video of her. And then uh, I think Arun Jaitley. Nandana's. No, uh, Kankana Sen Sharma. Oh, Good. Kankana is Aparna Sen's daughter. Upper Sen. No, uh, Nan yeah, they were. Nandana. They, she had two, he had two, he had two daughters, and what? you know, Amartya Sen wrote this uh, uh, essay, and he signed uh, this, uh, you know, one of the five hundred he signed before Modi's first election. Yeah. The next day, there was a sex video of this. She daughter. didn't tell me because I, she's a very dear friend of mine. This is this was on the news. That's how I know. That's how we're getting. Uh, I mean, like, uh, but but that, those are nowadays. You, you, you remember Rana Ayub, this journalist who wrote yeah. a book called Gujarat Files. So. Um, 
yeah, you know, the stigmatization and trying to shame you with sex is something which is very much used. So, you know, they morphed her face onto yeah. a porn video and circulated it where she's being raped by multiple men or something. Yeah, nowadays it's become so good, like they can just take your face and do anything. That's what is called deep fake, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Mm. You you don't, they, they just need a photo of your face and it'll be absolutely real. It'll be as real as any video. So that's a, I mean, that's a new level of threat. I don't know where people can say in all of these threats. I mean, like, basically, it's an internationalization of crime. I mean, that, that's what I think this uh, yeah. this thing uh, has done. But definitely, like, uh, there is this actual trafficking uh, that still has to be combated. I mean, that that that, that is still a real thing. And another thing that I found was, like, uh, what I felt was, uh, you know, visiting Western horizons, I mean, there's a huge migration. And there is this... Uh, yeah, a lot of Uriya girls are trafficked, especially Adivasi yeah, girls Adivasi's. are getting trafficked now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they seem uh, like the 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 local police officers, or the, you know, the army thinks that they are cheap. They see sex and everything. So, uh, I mean, that's uh, that is um, again in India. I guess like you have this additional challenge of the caste system and and the uh, you know like uh, so. One of the things is making these people second class citizens is that they are kind of available and they don't have any morals. Yeah. Um. So so it's hard to like just go after. I think. You know, it's not. Just... It's very hard, and also I think that someday we have to change our attitudes, because what is prostitution or human trafficking based on, really? One is greed, of course, you know, for profit or whatever. One part of it, but the other is also, you know, the desire for domination, and uh, you know, so it's like the mixture of sexism with poverty, right? And uh, it's crazy. It's based on creating a hierarchy, violating someone, uh, you know, all of that. It's not that, you know, people can't do the work themselves. Yeah, but then again, if we accept, you know, capitalism and fascism, which are doing similar things, I mean, not, not about sex, but it's... It is this, a, it but is it's unregulated. Thing. Here it's unregulated, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, that uh, whether... Is it possible in question, you know, like, if human nature doesn't have benevolence, which we can't assume in this case, then anything can be... Maybe it could be benevolent, but depending on the exposure. Uh, but is... Inequality of something is the only possible way humans can coexist. Is the is, the, is is what I never can understand. Like there has never is it possible to have an equal society, you know, equal in all sense, or is it like is it inevitably that we do seek you know inequality and domination? I mean, that's I think there's a deeper philosophical question. But I this think, is something that you people both there are two people in the room today who are studying <laughs> the human mind, and that can be a question that both of you can answer probably better than I can. But from my point of view, I think that at least we can dream about it. You know, it may always seem like a utopia, mm -hmm. but so many things seem like utopia and we achieve them. You know, I remember like, you know, there must have been a time in the world when the sun never set on the British Empire and in the high horses and red coats and all the pomp and ceremony with the bugle and soldiers everywhere. No, nobody thought the British Empire would end. And they had, at that time, the most sophisticated weaponry, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, of that time. So, But today, it's a pale shadow of its former self, that same empire. And even Sri Lanka is about to went into England and almost won a cricket match <laughs> against them. And the mayor of London is Bangladeshi. So, <laughs> you know, so time does show that, you know, there's possibility, right? And same thing with monarchy. People thought the the kings and queens would say they were descendants straight from the sun and the moon. And they made us believe that it was impossible to change that. It was like nature. It, it was as essential to everything as nature. But, you know, today most countries don't have monarchies. We, 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 we are experimenting with different kinds of democracies, which may produce dictators, but it's still not monarchies. So that everything is not as inevitable as we think. Yes, sometimes, you know, it takes its toll. It has a time lag so i i think it's possible to have a fairer world for sure i don't know if everybody has to become standardized in the same like i don't want to become white and blonde and blue eyed i i love spicy food and i want to be able to eat my fish or whatever and i like <laughs> to i have my own thing and i want to sit like this and i don't want to sit like this and all of that right i'm cultured in a certain way but that does not mean that i have to kill anyone i would still like to have friends who are blonde and blue eyed and uh, you know eat differently and maybe experience that 
so i think i i'm not asking for complete equality but i think a fairer world with dignity is something we can aspire to and make it happen so but i mean can we have that world within this economic system is the question or, or i mean that that's the question is i i think like so uh, yes if violence you know domination is there and and that comes out of this inequality and that comes out of our economic system so so yeah i mean like within sort of a benevolent capitalistic society you know that's what the world if that what the world is possible yeah if, if sweden model so to speak i think i know who knows you know we have to keep mm-hmm. right now it feels like our 100 years of solitude is over so <laughs> Okay. the baby with the tail of a pig is born and blood is flowing under the door and uh, you know it's like four of us are meeting here in this bar and only we know that there was a bookshop which existed and uh, there was a place here before the united fruit company came in and nobody had been slaughtered or the train which took away the dead soldiers at the top of the train only four of us will the kinship between us is that memory so maybe maybe that 100 years of solitude is over which began in 1917 with gandhi going to champaran and uh, lenin presenting the april thesis on exactly the same day coincidence oh, wow exactly the same day that's amazing yeah. one fact, against colonialism and once again against feudalism mm-hmm. so who knows what's coming next but surely this is not the end Yeah, I mean, uh, and also I was curious, like the effect of the films, like uh, you know, Zana Brzezinski's film or uh, Salam Bombay. What do you think? Like, did it have a? Because Zana Brzezinski, I saw that film. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that film on Peter Brothels. On Peter Brothels, uh, it was well almost fifteen years ago now. I think. Uh, I mean, you must be very familiar with that. Thing. Um, it did show, like, I think. uh you know which which um, some bombay didn't quite show but they showed the violence in a more realistic graphic manner i mean you know similar like to what she said like just the especially the children and, and like this uh, one of the it was apparently meant to help those children but there was this whole controversy about what zana biscuit did later after the movie you know mm. but apparently one of these movie obviously did go to leonard and mark as a as a photographer mm. but i was wondering like because that uh just like salam bombay puts a certain spin into you know who are these kids like you know living in this rubbish dump and then you know how money and the my world like you know the just money world is is a weird but uh never a question of why what sort of displacement projects sort of you know drives people into these rubbish dumps of bombay you know like that that's that should be there like you know you make these big projects and then you know these people are forced to leave and then you know that's where they land up you know but you know we're that sort of questioning the system so to speak but um yeah i mean so what what is the effect of you know what can be done in that sense like so you have your film which i'm sorry i say i haven't seen but uh, i i'll see uh, you know plan to see but uh, what is the effect of uh, what can be done and do you think films or the media are like where or what kind of awareness raising is being done and apart from your efforts currently there is i think there's always a good movie coming out and every movie has its flaws you know so we we'll never as activists i'll never be satisfied with any movie so i'll always say oh this is racist or this was not complex enough and it's true you know but the movie maker has their own compulsions uh, budgets and wherever they grew up coming from that perspective etc you know so why in the media it created some attention and you know it helps everything helps in the long run and uh, you know we i think what what did the biggest disservice uh, to our cause was pretty woman mm-hmm. for example because it had the cinderella story you know it was like glorification mm-hmm. of prostitution so uh, that was a more, most damaging film because every girl who was trafficked in europe was told that her life would be pretty woman but it wasn't it was the opposite so what do you view on like decriminalizing um so that the women who actually are into prostitution they um, are not facing like uh, issues from yeah, the so that's exactly and, what like, i was yeah. saying i think you were um, uh not so basically uh, what uh, we did was we made sure that uh, the women who were uh, in prostitution were uh, decriminalized in every way 
because that's why the whole idea of choice uh, to make people understand that uh, the means can be abuse of a position of vulnerability and women actually are faced by lack of choices and their choices are not a real choice so we went even deeper into this idea of decriminalizing by putting into law uh, that consent is irrelevant so not even just uh, decriminalizing it we've asked into law we put into law that you have to address the person's vulnerability in changing trafficking so you have to decriminalize but you have to help you have to support in uh, addressing her vulnerability which made her prey to the trafficker in the first place her or his vulnerability and the vulnerability can be based on class on caste on gender on sex all of that then we also asked just like in domestic violence that don't not just decriminalize the women but criminalize the trafficker because otherwise there's no protection for the poor woman when the trafficker comes and picks her up seduces her tricks her forces her um, even you know just manipulates her so uh, you have to punish the trafficker because for a poor person that's the only protection and penalize the customer so he realizes what the consequences of what he's doing so as is a very nuanced approach and we put that into the un protocol and into different laws across the world the laws that i like sweden norway france the two islands um, you know so 10 countries have passed those laws now and the, the others have is not yet huh us is not yet partially yeah. state by state we have to do it yeah. yeah federal law we've done it but we haven't been able yeah. to do it in the state law and um, who knows when we will because us hasn't even signed crc the convention on the rights of the child which is why they're not accountable for what's happening to the children who are being uh, kept in these deportation camps mm -hmm. detention camps Sometimes concentration camps, camps. <laughs> yeah i don't even know what word to use for it so uh, they're camp making camps. and some of them have been sold to traffickers some of them so some of those children have been sold to traffickers yeah. yes but i know the system is at fault when the camps start to make money like they're exactly. making profit yeah. now you know i was just thinking that exactly and i was thinking that you know um it's really interesting that uh, i was just you know i was talking to somebody about these uh, the same people who run prisons for profits in america are the ones running these detention centers de de detention camps for children and migrants and uh, new york state apparently has passed a law saying that no prison will be allowed to run here for profit in the new york state so i was thinking this morning that new york will become like the kerala of india yeah. you know where everything better will be done here and the rest of america can watch like yeah domino pizza you're right it's so much money the way the prison yeah. this real complex makes i mean now they're going to make college space. education free yeah. so they're doing so many things they're trying to make it much more humane this uh, state but in new york also in new york city has the most unequal zip code separated by 20 miles Mm. You know, Wall Street and uh, versus the Bronx. I think I the uh, highest and lowest uh, earnings. Wow. So uh, and the mortality, I think, uh, is different by twenty or thirty years. I read it in Chicago, where I lived. Also, you know, you uh, take the red line and just south of Fifty Fifth Street, it's a very different story. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's black, and uh, it's a very mm. weird place. Sometimes I landed up with a car. I mean, I didn't know where I was going, and I couldn't believe this is America. This is this is like a ghost town. You know, people are all drugged and like. Take classes behind, you know, gas station where I stop. But, but anyway, like it's a thirty years uh, lifespan difference. The person in black person in Bronx can live a shorter lifespan than in Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but, uh, so I mean, that's still like uh, New York State has that. I mean, that's uh, one thing that we can't forget. And New York, of course, New York State is a lot of, you know, Trump territory too. You know, let's not forget like the rest of New York, which is very big in you know, Buffalo and things like that, where is you know, solid amounts of racism. Uh, but But definitely, like there is a you know progressive movement, like California. You know, there are parts of California which is not blue, not not by any means. So um, I, I'm just yeah, I'm just very. I know, like uh, <laughs> you know, like this is a system that we live in. I subscribe to, but I I just can't see like how uh, uh, there can be benevolent capitalism. Essentially, that that that's my that's my mm -hmm. thing, and this all of these. you know rights movement come in a certain way when the structure allows these things to or you know is promoting inequality in some level that 
we must accept that there has to be incremental that that's what i yeah that's why i started with saying that if you normalize the market to the unregulated market you know that market needs no regulation then you know everything is justified if someone pays for it anything is justified if someone pays for it so my dear question i'm saying that i'm against it i'm not saying that i'm for it <laughs> just to clarify yeah but this is my biggest challenge is to face that off right um what about the situation that you initially thought that uh, uh some woman was poor or doesn't have i mean or even without poverty uh, maybe she um she was married and she suffered violence at the hands of the husband and in law and decided to leave the family and then some individual um, some males who don't have a partner and um, so there is some money exchange and uh, but without any compulsion no pimp no police mm-hmm. nothing so uh, how, how about uh, facilitating that kind of uh, I, i see nothing wrong with that kind of a situation right i i personally do because maybe because i'm a woman mm. so i feel it is still commodification of my body and i would rather have a relationship which was based on some kind of uh, understanding of me as a human being uh, which is based on a little bit of conversation with a little bit of jokes exchange a little bit of uh, more than just my body and sex so i personally am not for that but legally uh, it doesn't come under the purview of trafficking no but uh, supposing we had uh, ubi universal basic income so everybody is being um given a, one is not compelled to um exchange sex for the sake of living okay but still if somebody wants uh, extra money them to wants to splurge in something yeah I'll, i'll wait for that utopia to happen before i can answer that question mm-hmm. because i don't see that i think gender is such a pervasive inequality that i don't see any context where men and women are equal i've never come across a context where men and women are equal not even when margaret thatcher was prime minister of england or indira gandhi was prime minister of india i've never seen a situation where men and women no, are equal. any of this situation indira gandhi was prime minister so that doesn't mean that there is no equality or exactly. uh, women were part exactly. of anything yeah now but uh, you know you, i mean i have this this thing against universal basic income uh, it's a great idea i mean definitely like uh, it was really you know, but what is money for what is it useful for for this adivasi living in nyambiri top of hills their requirement of money is very different from mine just trying to survive in new york you know like uh, so so that and you were so basically mo- exactly. dependent on region definitely you know there cannot be like you give everybody five dollars or five hundred dollars a day it just is not it doesn't it doesn't make, make sense. sense yeah, yeah. No, of course so, it is definitely dependent upon the i mean in india whatever is the amount of money uh, that at one time that's given to everybody yeah, for but, living it would be different from my from over here i don't know yeah, but but even then you know equating everything to money is is a, that's what i think like this whole thing that today you know that roy thermula said like there's that one number that the one number is all that matters and and the point is like there's a see uh, adivasi living uh, in a forest has a right which is independent of money nothing to do with money like a right uh to you know their lands their living and their lifestyle and and say for women like uh, that 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 this question of uh, of a right you know and and then say human rights i think like you cannot translate a human right to uh or you know like you cannot buy a human life with money i mean then 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 there is nothing but money and then that should be the rule in the world like everything is a transaction let's face it like every conversation everything is a transaction everything let's put a dollar amount on it and also i think you know i think i think this debate is becoming a bit theoretical because you know you are to asking a very hypothetical question yeah. what i'm trying to tell you is that i don't want to answer the hypothetical question mm-hmm. 
I want to deal in the reality of now yeah. and the world, in my world, and in that world we are unequal and uh, girls are being taken advantage of and women are being taken advantage of, and so their consent is being obtained under unequal circumstances, even anyone. So at any level of education, jobs or whatever, from top to down. One more question, and then we can stop the live broadcast, and we can yeah. continue talking. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I, so I have a question in terms of you know the, all your work, just as far as like you know changing laws in the different countries. What kind of groups you're working with? Like, how is this happening? I mean, it sounds it's quite amazing to think. I think even more than the stuff. laws. I think I would like to end with talking about the girls uh, that I work with and the women that I work with on the ground. So Apne Aap, my NGO works in Calcutta in the red light districts of Khidirpur and Munshi Ganj, which is near the port district and in Sunagarchi, a red light area which was set up by British uh, by the British government during the British Raj for providing uh, uh, disease-free women to British soldiers and clerks by giving licenses to brothels where women were taken for medical checkups regularly. So I worked there to break the cycle of intergenerational prostitution. So the first, fo- and then I also work in Bihar uh, on the border of Nepal in this village called Forbes Ganj, Farbis Ganj, we say in Hindi. And there I work with a nut community, NAT. They were labeled as criminal tribes under British colonialism and therefore pushed out from their traditional land and their traditional occupations because the British wanted to replace their own manufacturing and their own trading. So what were the so, traditional? Well, so yeah. there are different. There are 16 such tribes uh, who are now trapped in intergenerational prostitution. But for example, uh, many of them were goatherds and they would keep their goats and they would sell dairy products and meat and they would live in the Himalayas and migrate down to the uh, foothills and uh, every time come down, settle on village common land, sell the products and go back to the Himalayas. Why so the British the criminal tribe? You ask the British that. Okay. Why they call them criminal. But I presume that uh, they were called a criminal tribe because the British said, banned them from traveling from the Himalayas to the foothills. They said you cannot move from one place to another. If you move from one place to another, that's a crime. The other reason they were labeled as criminals was that the British wanted to replace their meat products and dairy products uh, with their own products. So Coventers was a company which many of you in Eastern India will know about, which began to sell meat and uh, cheese and milk and all of that to all Indians. So they had to stop them from selling their meat. Same thing with engineering. So they used to make bamboo bridges and they would go from one place to another with bamboo bridges and rope bridges and make bamboo utensils. British engineers needed to export their engineers from America to set up the Howrah Bridge or to set up um, uh, utensils and all of that. So they banned them from making or selling it. Same thing with salt which Gandhi has so beautifully demonstrated. But there was a whole group which was trading in salt and going from one place to another, trading in salt. So they were labeled as criminals for selling the salt or going from one place to another to move, to sell the salt. So, they were so through an act of parliament, crimes. so through an act of parliament, they were called criminal tribes. And uh, so they were banned from doing that and they were forced to stay in their own wherever little segregated hamlets and they had to report to a police officer at midnight and at four in the morning to show that they were not traveling, Hazri it was called. And till this day in some places the tribes don't know that they're not supposed to do Hazri, so they still show up. So in Bihar I work with one such group called the Nuts. In uh, Delhi I work with two such groups called the Pednas and the Sasis and uh, they are from Jammu and all of that. And uh, what we do is help the children get into schools and make sure they stay in schools. We run community centers inside these uh, areas. And uh, what we also do is help the women um, get documents from birth certificates to caste certificates to voter cards. So they then become legal citizens of India and they can demand things as their rights and then give them political organizing skills so they can then go to the district magistrate or the ward officer and get um, 
linked to low cost food low cost housing low cost health care and thereby create their own exit strategies so sometimes we also work intergenerationally we'll work with the mother we'll work with the daughter we'll work with the grandchild and literally we have been able to reverse uh, the the uh, prostitution which was intergenerational since 150 years to over it's finished so in bihar where we work uh, you know we have actually there were 72 brothels in the red light area when we began work now there're just four and it's by the way putting the traffickers in jail the women taking over the houses as their own houses and we put the children into school so it's changed completely same thing we are doing in kidarpur and sonagachi okay. same thing we did in bombay so when the women took over the house i mean control of the house did they leave the prostitution or yeah they have so they started small businesses tea shops and uh, grocery stores and one even started her own dance company so uh on behalf of aid uh, association for india's development uh, new york city we uh, thank uh, ruchira for uh, her amazing uh, talk and uh, insightful discussions on um, the issue of uh, the sex trafficking, trafficking sex and prostitution um, so we have we we are, like i'm pretty sure we have a lot to talk about uh, and uh, but here like we are running a uh, kind of late mm-hmm. so um if you are interested in uh, knowing more about richard's work uh, please uh, go to apneap.org uh, which is a p n e a a p dot o r g uh, right here the link will also be in the uh, video description and uh, please consider donating to the cause um thank you very much for tuning in uh, yes um <laughs> nobody is for sale no way thank, thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you, thank you. Yeah.